This is going to be your fourth lecture on cells. <laughs> I have to I have to tell you a little story here first. So earlier today, I went into our lecture hall to shoot this video in a very professional setting. And uh, my camera, this new camera I bought, the audio was just total trash. So I watched it and I just found it unacceptable to give you this lecture with trash audio. So I went back and I picked up a, um, a external microphone for this camera. Okay, went back, shot the lecture a second time and uh, watched it and the audio was not much better. I was like, you know what, man, I've done it twice. I'm not doing this a third freaking time. So I went to upload it and I realized that even though the video quality is half what you're getting with this and the camera that I'm using here, which is not meant to be a video camera, I might add, uh, even though the quality was utter trash by comparison, uh, the file was almost nine gigabytes of size and it would have taken literally days to upload. It was just hilarious to me. So here we are shooting this lecture for the third time and uh, hopefully it's going to be decent. Um, but I had to share with you my trials and tribulations. I was like, man, I gotta get this lecture to him. Let me shoot this video. Man, I gotta get this lecture to him. And here we are, man. Here we are. So, oh gosh, have mercy. I'm sorry it's taken a while, but I've probably got six hours into this lecture right now. Just right this second. Probably at least five or six hours. And um, it's about to be eight or nine once it's all said and done. Hooray. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I just had to tell you, you know, you, you had to know how much time I'm putting into this for you guys. I hope you appreciate it. So with that in mind, uh, let's do cells for the third time. So, um, if, you, if, if I sound a little upset, you know why, at least. All right. <clears throat> Cells. So uh, up until the 1600s, we weren't exactly sure it, how how organisms were structured. It, it wasn't until this time that the term cell was coined by a guy named uh, Robert Hooke. Uh, he was uh, using very early handmade microscopes. He and another gentleman named Anton von Leeuwenhoek around the same time, building uh, microscopes that would allow them to see quite small things. And uh, using this knowledge, they were able to discern that there were, in fact, smaller units of life than that which is visible to the naked eye. It wasn't until just a couple hundred years ago with Matthias Schleiden and Theodore Schwann that what's referred to now as unified cell theory came to pass. They sort of took all the information that was available to them and discerned this unified theory of cells and gave it five basic tenets that we will discuss here today. And they are as follows. Uh, all organisms are composed of cells and cellular products. Okay? Cells are the basic structural and functional units of life. Now what that means is very simple. If it's living, it has to be made of a cell or cells. Okay? You are multicellular. There are plenty of unicellular organisms out there that are still living. But if it's acellular, like a virus for instance, or a prion, they're considered non-living. Even though viruses and prions can display what seems like a lifelike um, life history structure, they are considered non-living because they are acellular, right? And, uh, okay, numbers three and four. The activities of cells manifest themselves as, as organismal activity and cellular activity reflects their structural components. That's a fan This is a, a fancy way of getting at cells do what they do based off the type of the organelles that they are found with and sort of getting at the idea that cells make up tissues that have a given function, all right? And then last but not least, number five, life is propagated through cellular activity. Um, Louis Pasteur would say, omni vivum ex vivo, only from life comes life. What this basically is saying is that the concept of what's now called spontaneous generation is utter nonsense. Uh, 300 years ago, you take a piece of cheese and you set it out and you come back after a day and it's got mold growing on it. You say, oh, look at that, it's, it's a miracle. You know, there's life has generated from nothing. We now know that's utter nonsense because we have an understanding of microbes. Uh, but at the time, long, you know, long ago, uh, we were under the impression that life could just spontaneously generate. It wasn't until unified cell theory really 
uh, that we got at that life is propagated only through other living things. Now, I will invite you to pause this video right now, go to your PowerPoint, copy this, paste it into your browser, and watch this video. If you want to be enriched as a human being, watch a single cell divide, develop a cardiovascular system, develop a nervous system, and then become a functioning organism. This is a cool video, and it's worth your time. You should use it as a learning experience to view cellular division. It's the true shame of it is that, well, that's good. All right, <clears throat> let's talk about some microscopic information here. So three terms that are worthy of our consideration when it comes to microscopes. And I want to talk about microscopes a little bit today because we will be dealing with them in lab and further. It's good for you just to have a grasp of uh, microscopes and sort of how they work. Uh, magnification, resolution, and contrast. Magnification deals with how many times you can make something bigger, in essence. Uh, something that's on 200 times magnification means this is 200 times bigger than what you could see with the naked eye. Okay, so it's just a, a, a means of gauging size. Resolution is basically your capacity to tell the difference between two things uh, when viewing them in a very small size. Uh, how do they describe it? Is the minimum distance between two objects that allow them to be seen as two separate objects. Uh, the essence of it is the higher your resolving power, the sharper your image will be. So this is very low resolving power. This is very high resol resolving power. And then last but not least, contrast. Uh, contrast basically allows you to tell the difference between similarly shaded objects. It's the difference in shading of an object compared to its background. So here we have very little contrast, so we can't really make out a lot of detail. Whereas here, when we increase the contrast by augmenting the way that the light flows through, uh, you can see all of these external surface modifications that are pretty darn fascinating from my perspective. Now, the first type of microscope that is worthy of our consideration is the compound light microscope. And it's called a compound light scope because it uses standard visible light as its uh, means of uh, viewing something. And it's a compound scope, meaning that it has more than one lens. So here's an objective lens and here's an ocular lens. More than one lens means compound light microscope. Now uh, these scopes can magnify things up to about a thousand times but you can jump through a few hoops to get it to do that. Most of the time they go up to about 400 and that's all you can really get. Going any higher than that you're stressing the, the system so to speak. Um, now these do have pretty decent resolving power which is nice and uh, they are very handy. The, the what I would like for you to realize about a compound light microscope is that they work pretty well. You can magnify things pretty well. They're cheap, they're easy, and you can view living specimens, which is excellent. All right, so this is a compound light microscope. Compared to a transmission electron microscope and a scanning electron microscope where your specimens have to be dead, okay? Uh, here, the transmission scope, these uh, can magnify huge amounts, all right? 10 million time magnification in some cases. But the problem for me is with the transmission scope, you get these kind of ugly 2D images. They're just not as pretty, so I don't get as much out of them. Uh, by comparison to a scanning electron microscope, where they have very, uh, let me rephrase, where they don't have quite the magnification, still very good, but uh, not quite as good as a uh, transmission scope. But the images you get from a scanning electron scope are just so much cleaner and prettier. It's a way better system from my perspective personally. All right, organisms and cells. Now, I want to point out here that we are not that different from most other living things. You know, other mammals and you are virtually identical in terms of the proteins you can make and the structure of your system. Uh, you versus, you know, most other organisms. We are all quite similar. Even things that are quite dissimilar in appearance, like a, a plant, it's actually, you know, they, the, we are similarly structured. <coughs> oh, man. All right. So, for instance, here's a leaf. The leaf has an external cuticular lining, a surface modification. Then there's this outer uh, cellular network that sort of shields the upper layers. Then underneath that, there's a vascular network that's not unlike your vascular network in your connective tissue, which has overlying epithelium that protects that layer. And then surface modifications that uh, have further function for those cells. The idea here is that, that we are not entirely unlike other living things. We are all sort of in this together. And cellular... Uh, cell speaking, if you will, uh, pretty similar in reality. Now, I just want to make a comment here. This is giving you a gauge of the size of cells. So this is uh, in nanometers all the way up to a kilometer, giving you an idea. 
and frankly it's pretty useless. What I want to use this for is a reminder to myself to talk about cell sizes. And that is that, uh, for instance, your liver cells are not any different from the liver cells in a whale. The whale just has a bigger liver with more cells in it. Okay, cells can reach a really a maximal size and then go no further because they lose function if, in, in essence. And I'll, I'll show you more about that in just a second. Uh, but I do want to talk about this. You need to understand that this is a red blood cell and red blood cells in the grand scheme are pretty freaking small. Okay, these are, they are not large. And uh, this is a given bacteria. So this is a small eukaryotic cell. Here's a regular sized prokaryotic cell. And uh, this prokaryotic cell then compared to uh, some virus particles. So smallpox, polio, there's bacteriophage. Um, viruses are tiny compared to a bacterium, and the bacterium is tiny compared to a eukaryotic cell. So just try to wrap your mind around that, just how small viral particles are compared to eukaryotic cells. Um, I had a student one time, you know, the, the timid hand goes up, and they say, um, uh, Mr. Hopper, why, why does, uh, like if you look at a, a contraceptive package, like a condom or something like that, why does it say that it's got a really high chance of stopping um, sexually transmitted diseases, but it doesn't really get at pregnancy? So I have to go through and explain that like a sperm cell is massive compared to something like a virus or a bacterium that could lead to a sexually transmitted disease. So if it can stop a virus, you know, there's nothing's getting through that's of any other size, okay? It's just a neat way to gauge these things as a concept from my perspective. Uh, now, cell size, surface area to volume ratios. This is sort of what I was getting at a little bit earlier. Uh, cells can only reach a certain maximal size until they lose um, basic efficiencies, okay? So you got to think the cell has to be able to diffuse in water and nutrients and gases and diffuse out waste products of various formats or products therein. Uh, so the cell, if it's very large, it has a hard time diffusing things in and out with any kind of speed. It's far more efficient to have lots of small cells with lots of surface area to do this. And in fact, that's the way this works. So cells reach a given maximal volume, and that's as, really as big as they get, okay? Because we have to maintain efficiency of those cells, uh, and the, the best way to maintain efficiency is by keeping the cell small so you can very quickly diffuse materials in and out of the core of that cell. Okay, uh, not all microbes are bad for us. There's actually plenty of them out there that are very good and healthy and important. I feel like good cheese, that's the product of microbes, uh, breaking down those milk proteins and giving us that delicious, tasty cheese. Don't believe me? Go to uh, Publix or something like that and grab a camembert or a brie and just stick it up your nose and <sighs> take a deep breath. And it's going to smell like the worst foot odor or armpit you've ever smelled uh, because foot odor and armpit odor is bacterial odor and bacteria can break down these cheeses too and release the same basic scent. Uh, it's delicious by the way, this stuff. Uh, we use bacteria that are genetically engineered for all sorts of processes these days. So we have genetically engineered bacteria that manufacture insulin for us for example. So we, we don't make the insulin in other, any other synthesized means. We just use bacteria to make the uh, insulin for us for people that are diabetic. Um, they're super important as nutrient decomposers, that's absolutely factual. Without them, we'd be up to our elbows and leaf matter everywhere we go. And uh, of course, if you like unfiltered beer, or any spirit for that matter, it's all the product of bacterial, or I'm sorry, of yeast activity in this particular case, still a microbe. An unfiltered beer is cloudy looking in appearance because it has dead yeast in it. Uh, which are the organisms that ferment the sugars and turn that into alcohol. If you go to Publix and you find an unfiltered beer and you lift it up and look at the bottom of the bottle, it'll have a layer of white dusty powder stuff on the bottom. That's dead yeast that has settled out because it hasn't been filtered. So a lot of microbes are very important for us. Uh, but that is to say that some of them are bad, some of them are pathogenic, and they can make you get very, very sick. All right, uh, types of cells. So in the world around us, there are prokaryotic cells and there are eukaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells are those that lack membrane-bound organelles, including nuclei. Prokarya means before nucleus. These are going to be very small and very simple. Bacteria, for example. 
Uh, they will have a nucleary region, not a nucleus, but a distant area that contains some DNA. And oftentimes they'll have little accessory plasmids, and that might come into play later on. So know what a plasmid, it, plasmid is. They're just little accessory rings of DNA. Again, these are things like bacteria, and they're very small, very simple internally. Uh, just one big ring-like chromosome, nothing fancy. Uh, eukaryotic cells, by comparison, are much, much larger. And uh, they have all sorts of membrane-bound organelles and so a lot of neat stuff happening internally. They have a nucleus that contains their genetic material, um, just bigger and far more complicated, with animal cells being a little smaller than plant cells. So plant cells are huge, animal cells tend to be a little smaller, and then bacteria are tiny, tiny, tiny by comparison to that. Now, in the realm of the prokaryotic cells, there are actually two... Um, uh, domains, if you will. Yes, sorry, my brain was shut down for a second. And and those are bacteria and archaea. Okay, bacteria and archaea. Bacteria being those which are ubiquitous with the world around us. They're just sort of found everywhere. Um, man, you know, like on my my Mr. Pib here. There's bacteria all over the place on my phone here. There's bacteria all over the place. Um, they're ubiquitous with the world around us. They're just found everywhere and we use them for our benefit. Uh, our internals, our intestinal tract, for example, is just covered in bacteria. Um, and archaea, by comparison, only live in extreme habitats as we established previously. You only find these in like sulfur ponds or the like. Uh, extreme habitats, salt water, extremely salty water, deep sea hydrothermal vents. Yeah, but these are the, the domains of uh, prokarya. And uh, then, let's see, the structures. The structures of prokaryotes, uh, worthy of mention here are the three shapes that you tend to find um, bacteria in. These are coccus, bacillus, and spirillium. Cocci are round balls, bacillus are rods, and spirillium are little spiral shapes. And very important from my perspective is that all these bacteria have cell walls made out of what's called peptidic lichen. Peptidic lichen is not something you find outside of the bacterial lineage. And what you'll notice is that a lot of the antibacterial agents that we utilize, so if you go and you take um, antibiotic drugs, those antibiotic drugs that are designed to kill bacteria, what they do is they attack peptidic lichen. Because if it attacks peptidic lichen, it can't hurt you in any way, shape, or form, but it destroys all the bacteria in your system. So it works. Imagine it's stripping their skin off, if you will. And some bacteria also have glycocaps, uh, glycocalyx capsules, I should say. This is like a little sugar coat, and it just helps to protect them internally. But the main thing I want to focus on is as follows. The shapes, peptidic lichen being a component of their cell wall, like cellulose is in the cell wall of plants, and then this nucleoid region with potentially uh, accessory rings of DNA called plasmids. Now, worthy of mention here is the eukaryotic cell endosymbiotic theory. Okay. Endosymbiotic theory. Uh, what this basically states is that the earliest in, I'm sorry, let me try again. The earliest uh, eukaryotic cells probably were invaded by very early bacterium that led to the differentiation into mitochondria and chloroplast. Mitochondria and chloroplast provide energy from the for the cells. Uh, but if you look at your mitochondria, or if you take a plant and look at that plant's chloroplast, what you'll notice is that they are basically bacteria. Uh, they have bacterial ribosomes, they have bacterial DNA. Like in your cells, you have human DNA, and if you extract your mitochondria and look at it, they have bacterial DNA. Um, the thought is that these early invaders got into a, eukaryotic cells and set up shop. They provided the eukaryotic cells with ATP or carbohydrates or some sort of benefit and the eukaryotic cells then protected them because the uh, these these invaders were providing them with a service. Uh, this is endosymbiotic theory. The idea that early prokaryotic cells invaded early eukaryotic cells and that led to what we now call mitochondria and chloroplast. Right? This is concerned across all eukaryotic lineage. You still find these. Uh, so this is endosymbiotic theory and you need to be familiar with this. Now here's a nice animal uh, animal cell versus a plant cell, and you need to be familiar with this as well. This is so important from my perspective. Uh, I really want to focus on the differences between these, and the differences are as follows. Animal cells tend to be kind of small, and they lack a cell wall. Animal cells don't have cell walls. Plant cells have cellulose-based cell walls, and they're quite large. And one of the reasons they're quite large is because they have massive central vacuoles. There's a critter in here.
anyway. Massive central vacuoles. Uh, the central vacuole is very large, so that just makes the cell a lot bigger. And what will happen is the central vacuole will fill with fluid and apply pressure to the cell wall and make the cells of the plant rigid. And that's why uh, herbaceous plants can sit up straight. So let's see, they're bigger, they have cell walls, they have chloroplast and mitochondria, whereas animal cells only have mitochondria, they lack chloroplast. So plants have both, animals only have mitochondria, and uh, I'm pretty happy with that. Yeah. So in the realm of eukaryotic cells, there are two types of organelles. These are the energy-related organelles in mitochondria and chloroplast, and we're going to spend like a week on each one of those as time progresses. Uh, and then, of course, there is the endomembrane system, which gets the real function of the cell. What I want you to think about is that the energy-related organelles provide the power to run this, and this is what the cell does. This is the job the cell does, and this is what provides the power for that. Okay, energy-related organelles versus the endomembrane system. Uh, where am I at? Chloroplast. Okay, you need to go ahead and familiarize yourself with the formula for um, photosynthesis. I'm going to run through this with you a couple times here. The idea is that plants, as an example, they're not the only ones, but plants have chloroplasts. Chloroplasts do photosynthesis. That's a process of taking sunlight and making sugar out of it. Okay? Plants have chloroplasts and chloroplasts conduct photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is the process of taking carbon dioxide and water, which is what plants need, using the sun's energy to make a carbohydrate, which is a high energy storage molecule, and they release as a byproduct oxygen. That's what photosynthesis is. You need to know about this formula. You don't have to recite the numbers for me, but just grasp that carbon dioxide and water and uh, sunlight go in and a carbohydrate and oxygen come out. Now, the reason that chloroplasts can do photosynthesis is because they contain a pigment called chlorophyll amongst others. There are other pigments, but chlorophyll is an important one, and uh, chlorophyll is photoactive. It's capable of sequestering energy, sequestering energy from sunlight. Now, where do you find the chlorophyll within a chloroplast? Here's a chloroplast. Inside of here, there are these little disks, and those disks are called thylakoids. And the thylakoids are stacked up in stacks called grana. A grana is a stack of thylakoids, and the thylakoids contain chlorophyll, which allows a chloroplast to do photosynthesis. If I were you, I'd pause it and listen to that like three times. It's a lot of information that you need to be familiar with. And uh, then there are the mitochondria. So uh, mitochondria are found in pretty much every type of cell, you know, animal, plant, you name it. And they certainly are uh, unique. They contain their own back, basically bacterial DNA. And they conduct a process called cellular respiration, which I should have, yeah, there it is, cellular respiration. Um, inside of mitochondria, you can find these little projections that are called the cristae, and the fluid in here is called the matrix. Now, let me just run you through this. What a mitochondria does is cellular respiration. Cellular respiration is taking a sugar and oxygen, which is what you breathe in, and making energy in the form of ATP. And then you have two byproducts of metabolism, and those are carbon dioxide and water. So mitochondria do cellular respiration. They take sugar and oxygen, and they kick out carbon dioxide, water, and usable energy in the form of ATP. I would need you to notice that this is the opposite uh -oh, of that. That is the opposite of this. They go back and forth. All right. One takes sunlight and makes uh, sugar, which is chemical energy. The other takes sugar, which is chemical energy, and makes ATP, which is chemical energy that your muscles use. All right. So this is very important as processes go. Now let's talk about the endomembrane system. Uh, the first thing I need to mention is just a little conversation on the nucleus of cells. It, it's fascinating and worthy of your time. Uh, the nucleus of the cell has three basic regions. These are called the nuclear envelope, chromatin, and the nucleoli. Now before I move on, let me say the following. Uh, most of your cells do indeed have a single nucleus. Some can be multinucleated, like liver cells or skeletal muscle cells. Uh, and blood cells lack nuclei altogether, or I'm sorry, red blood cells lack nuclei altogether. Uh, and what that means is that basically they have no capacity to make protein. So if a red blood cell becomes damaged, it's destroyed and removed from the body. 
Now, let's talk about how your DNA is structured. Your DNA is a double helix. It's a double helix and it wraps around these things called histone proteins. And in a given cell, in a given period of time, the DNA is in the form of chromatin. Chromatin is like a loose assemblage of genetic material all in a big ball. Like all these chromosomes, they are uh, in a relaxed state and they just form this big ball inside the cell. You know, you can't really see a chromosome in there. They're in there, but they're uncoiled. The only time you actually coil up and make chromosomes, like these good old-fashioned X-shaped chromosomes, is just prior to mitotic cell division. And we'll talk about that at a later date. Um, now, the nuclear envelope's important. Okay, look here. Nuclear envelope, chromatin, nucleoli. The nuclear envelope is very important because it has small openings called the nuclear pores. The idea is that uh, DNA as a molecule is massive and it's too big to escape the nuclear pores. So if you need a replicate of a gene to leave the nucleus and go out into the cytoplasm where you make protein, you know, your, your DNA is just a cookbook for how to make proteins. There's nothing fancy about it at all. So if you need, if the cell needs to make protein, what it will do is it'll make a copy of a piece of DNA, a small, tiny little copy of a piece that's small enough to escape the nuclear pores, and then that'll go out into uh, what's called the rough endoplasmic reticulum so that you can uh, manufacture proteins in the cytoplasm. It's sort of a long story, but that, that's a nice little take-home message there. Uh, so the nuclear envelope is special because it has nuclear pores that are too small to allow DNA to exit. Now, DNA, again, is stored in the form of chromatin. Uh, this is basically DNA and histones for the most part, and uh, it, it's amorphous. You really can't tell much about it. And the nucleus oftentimes will also contain a nucleolus. And what's important about the nucleolus, which is a little dark spot right here, is uh, it's the area where you make ribosomes. Right? Ribosomes are made in the uh, nucleus in the region called the nucleolus. And uh, ribosomes, the two halves are made there. So ribosomes are two-part subunits. There's a top and a bottom, and they are going to be made in the nucleolus. They will exit through the nuclear pores and then go out and get stuck to the rough endoplasmic reticulum where they do their work. In fact, uh, we call the rough endoplasmic reticulum the rough ER because it has ribosomes studying it, and ribosomes do the work of making protein. So this is your take-home message. The nucleus contains DNA. All right, the nucleus contains DNA. That DNA is a code for how to make proteins. Uh, you can't get the DNA out of the nucleus because the molecule is too big. So what do you do? You make an RNA molecule, which is a small little copy of a gene. It can leave the nuclear envelope through the nuclear pores and get into the rough ER. The rough ER is a building in which ribosomes make protein. The rough ER is where the ribosomes do their job. And the ribosome's job is to make protein. So you're going to make primary strands of protein here in the rough ER. Uh, that is then going to be offloaded to a structure called the Golgi apparatus. And think about the Golgi apparatus as finalizing everything, putting it into its usable form. So this is going to make all the parts and pieces necessary to do a job. Then this is going to make it into a format where the job can get done and offload that potentially for exocytosis from the cell or releasing it into the cell to do some sort of job internally. Uh, so that, that's how this works. There's a few other things on here that are worthy of our consideration. For instance, like smooth endoplasmic reticulum can do all kinds of different things in different cells. Sometimes they do manufacture cholesterol that's used in these cell membranes. Sometimes they certainly can be used in the liver, for instance, to detoxify alcohol. Uh, in other cases, like in skeletal muscle, all the smooth ER really does is store calcium. Like, th there's a bunch of functions for smooth ER, uh, whereas rough ER is the house where proteins are made by ribosomes. Uh, lysosomes are important. They contain digestive enzymes. Uh, cells use these for a whole host of purposes. Sometimes they're even released from the cell to do jobs. Yeah, that's good enough for me. Uh, this is basically outlining everything I just said in a slightly different way. I like to give you this type of stuff in a bunch of different formats, so if my description doesn't work for you, you can use that. Or alternatively, you can go to your textbook and do a little bit of reading. Um, here is a breakdown of all of these structures and a variety of functions that they have. I would read this. It's going to help you understand what we just did. And then this runs, or I'm sorry, I thought there was more than one. This is going to run you through a basic description of how all this stuff fits. All right, uh, we need to have a little bit further conversation, the first of which is on vacuoles. So uh, plant cells have a central vacuole, as you can see here. And that central vacuole stores all sorts of stuff for the plant. Mostly it stores water, uh, but it's also going to store other substances that are important. 
and when it fills up, it applies pressure to the cell, as we described, as turgor pressure. So if you look at this plant when it's wilted, and they add water to it, and it stands up, that's the cells in there filling with water, generating what's called turgor pressure, and uh, forming what we commonly call a hydrostatic skeleton, and making that plant stand up. It basically gives it structure. Yeah. And uh, the plant also stores all sorts of other stuff inside of that um, central vacuole, like a lot of toxins. Uh, you know, how do you keep from getting eaten by predators in the wild? Because you're fast, maybe you're armed, you know, you know better than to go in certain situations. How does a tiger keep from being eaten by other predators in the wild? Well, they have sharp claws, they have sharp teeth. How does a deer keep from getting eaten by coyotes? They can hear them, they can smell them. Well, how do plants keep from getting eaten, eaten by herbivores? They can't get up and run away. They don't have sharp claws, generally. I mean, some of the briars aren't very palatable. But the idea is a lot of these will generate very toxic substances that they store in their central vacuoles. Uh, you can go and you can look at a, uh, a grazing field for cattle, and you'll see that the grass is cropped off tight to the ground. But there's plenty of other stuff growing that the cows just refuse to eat. And the reason the cows refuse to eat it is because it tastes disgusting in most cases because of toxic substances like tulines and quinines uh, that are found in that central vacuole. It's a neat thing. Okay, it's a pretty neat concept. Uh, and then worthy of our consideration is the concept of what's called tonicity. Tonicity. Like tone. Tonicity. Uh, if you play... Well, hang on. we got to get a couple of concepts out of the way first. And those are... Solute and solvent. Okay, solute and solvent. A solute is a, um, a, a powder generally or something that uh, attracts fluids to it. And then a solvent is going to be an aqueous solution. Uh, the, what I'm really trying to get at here is imagine a beaker full of water. That is a solution. And then, oh no, wrong. That is a solvent. And then your solute would be Kool-Aid. You could pour into that, all right, and you could have a cup of Kool-Aid. So the solution is water, the solute. Jeez, that's the second time I've done that. I can tell that I've done this several times because my brain's shutting down and refusing to cooperate. Let's try again. Let me sit up straight. I'm even going to focus. So um, the solute is like a, the, the Kool-Aid you pour in there, and the solvent is um, the, the water itself. Imagine a world where a red blood cell is placed into a purely aquatic solution. So you take a red blood cell, it's got proteins and, and salt and all kinds of stuff internally to it in that red blood cell. And it's placed into a distilled water situation. Uh, water on the outside is going to run in via osmosis and make this cell swell up. That would be placing a cell into a hypotonic environment. The cell has a higher solute concentration, so water chases the solute. Okay, and it makes that cell swell up, and in, in some cases it can even lice, it can burst. Because, unlike plant cells that have a cell wall, animal cells just have a membrane, so they're capable of rupture. Uh, by comparison, a hypertonic environment. If you place a cell in a hypertonic environment, that means that the fluid around that cell is going to have just all the salt in the world, or something along those lines. Uh, so water chases out from the cell into the external environment, it's osmotic balance. Water leaves the cell and makes the cell shrivel up or what we call crenate. Okay? It gets this, uh, this, this spiky uh, form as you can see here. And alternatively, if you place the cell into an environment that has exactly the same solute concentration as the cell, that red blood cell keeps its nice little concave donut shape, um, which is ideal. Which is ideal. Now this can be a real problem for humanity. Uh, if you want to be terrified, uh, pause the video and go look up what's called water toxicity and uh, you'll probably learn a little something about the dangers of uh, kidney function. Anyway. Yeah, okay. Uh, and really the reason I'm showing you that is to come to this slide here about the cytoskeleton. Uh, Cells have a cytoskeleton. They have a skeleton not unlike the way you have a skeleton. So, of the uh, cytoskeletal elements that are worthy of our consideration, there are microfilaments, intermediate filaments, and microtubules. Uh, microfilaments are involved in motility. Uh, they are in, uh, made up of what are called actin subunits, and they can allow cells to move around a little bit. You can actually see this amoeba reaching around and grabbing 
this paramecium. You can see the little foot sticking out. It's going to grab that and uh, digest it away. Uh, that is the activity of microfilaments, allowing for movement even in single-celled organisms. There are intermediate filaments, and intermediate filaments are basically like rope. They are uh, they have a very very high tensile strength. Oftentimes they attach to structures called desmosomes in cells. Like my skin is a uh, all the cells in my skin are attached using desmosomes, and that means I can't tear a hunk of uh, flesh off because it's got all these intermediate filaments in there that will hold it all together. So you can grab the skin on your arm and pull, and you can feel it all over the arm because all those cells are linked together structurally via intermediate filaments. It allows cells to function as a unit in terms of tension. And then there are microtubules. Uh, microtubules are important because they are like tent poles inside the cell. When the cell shrivels up like a crenated cell in a hypertonic environment, you can see the little spikes sticking out. Those are microtubules. Okay, they're big structural units. If these are um, like ropes, these are geez, I don't know, tent poles or, or power poles even, like big, thick, strong things that hold the cell open. And they have a second function, do microtubules. Uh, microtubules allow for motor proteins to transport things around the cell on them. That's a fancy way of saying that microtubules are like the subway inside your cells. If an organelle needs to move around, if a vesicle needs to be transmitted from one place to another, it'll just attach to a microtubule and be carried from one place to the next. Because these are not rare within the cells, they just radiate all over the place. So all of these, and shown in here in yellow, these are microtubules. And uh, this is just demonstrating to you that cells, can, or sorry, uh, vesicles can attach and be carried from one place to another using these microtubules. This is a real thing. Okay, this is a real thing. These motor proteins are real. Uh, and centrioles, I don't really have a whole lot to say about. What I will say is they give rise to cilia and flagella, which are worthy of our consideration. Uh, cilia come in two forms. There are modal cilia and there are non-modal cilia. Non-modal cilia tend to be uh, sensory receptors. For instance, you can hear me right now because you have little non-modal cilia in your ears that are vibrating and acting as sensory receptors, sending off messages to your brain to tell you that you're hearing the words I'm saying. And then by comparison, there are modal cilia. Now, some organisms use modal cilia, like this paramecium here. You can see the beating of the cilia, power stroke, recovery stroke, power stroke, recovery stroke, pushing and then recovering, classic ciliary activity. Uh, by comparison, Oh, let me say this too. You, you you have cilia as well. So you have cilia in your respiratory tract that cleanse the respiratory tract of debris, um, not unlike the cilia found in that paramecium. And then, by comparison, there are also flagellum. Now, in the mammalian lineage, lineage the only uh, flagella that I'm particularly aware of is that it's the tail of the sperm. Uh, it allows like a, a swimming-like motion, if you will, to propel this thing from one place to the next. And uh, then in the prokaryotic world, flagella actually are far more complicated. They work like little biomotors, so they spin, and they have, in essence, propellers that are propelling them from one place to the next. So flagella are just a little bigger and complicated by comparison to cilia. And um, that's pretty much the extent, I believe. So I invite you to read all this stuff. It's all good information. Again, I try to give you a lot of information extraneously like this so that you can read it and learn a little bit more. I've given you all that you really need. Uh, more good information, a nice chart. And that's it, man. That's it. So I hope this was painless for you. I'm sorry it took so long. <sighs> man, I tell you, it's been a real struggle getting this done. So, um, yeah. Yeah, that's it. So you have a test coming up. I will be studying if I were you. All right. Thanks, guys.